When you look at the epistle reading for today, I think if you took a survey of people who listened to it, and you were to ask them, which word jumps out at you the most? I think, for those of us who were paying attention and remember the epistle reading we just heard, I think most people would probably say, submit. That word submit, pastor, that's the word that jumps out, specifically in the context of verse 22, wives, <laughs> come on, men, don't be scared to say it. <laughs> yeah, you know, you ought to be me, the preacher. <laughs> wives, submit to your husbands. I'm telling you what, you know, I, I, as, a, as a young preacher, I remember the first time, you know, I preached a, on this text, and I, holy cow, you know, talking about submitting, that's not a popular, can we just be, can we be honest here? Submitting is not a popular topic for anybody. You know, and especially these days, the idea that a, a wife would submit to her husband, I mean, give me a break. Good luck preaching that, pastor. You know, the lectionary is a wonderful thing. The lectionary is the assigned set of readings that we have. It's, it's a wonderful thing. It has a great history. It goes all the way back to the Jewish captivity in Babylon. Very practical, a lot of great purpose to it. I would submit to you humbly that this is one spot where they got it wrong. What do I mean by that? This reading, the epistle reading, starts with verse 22. Wives, <laughs> these wives are looking at me. Wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. You're like, yeah, he's not anything like the Lord, Jim. <laughs> Stick with me, I'm going to get you there. <laughs> this is one place where they got it wrong, I think. And I have my own suspicions as to why they got it wrong also. See, it really, it, grammatically, linguistically, if you look at Ephesians chapter 5, that reading should have started a verse earlier. It should have started in verse 21. If you look at the sentence structure of that letter to the, the church there, uh, it, it, it really begins in verse 21. And if you just would begin the reading, if they would have just began that reading in verse 21, there'd be so much, so many more pastors who'd be so happy. Because verse 21 says, submit to one another, uh-huh, out of reverence for Christ. And so the whole thing starts with this idea of mutual submission. Submit to one another. Now all the wives are like, <laughs> see? <laughs> Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And, and it's, it's important to, to know that, that, that we are to submit to one another. And yes, wives are highlighted, submit to your husband. But then also then later in the reading, it goes on to highlight husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And, you know, for a long time, I, I taught and preached on that as this is a special requirement of men for their spouses that we are to do something super sacrificial here, to love our wives as Christ loved the church. And that is true, but the fact of the matter is that Christ also makes it clear, and we're going to look at John chapter 13 here in just a little bit, that loving your spouse as Christ loved the church is not something unique just to husbands. <laughs> and all the husbands are like, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> Because wives are called to love their husbands also, just as Christ loved the church. And so we're going to look at John chapter 13, verse 34, where Jesus says this, A new commandment I give to you, love each other. Love each other as I have loved you. A new commandment. And so that's what we're going to talk about today, the 11th commandment. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for today. We thank you, Father, because of your love and your mercy in our lives. We thank you, Father, for your word, which reveals to us your will. It is meant for us to be a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. Father, guide us into paths of righteousness for your name's sake. 
Father, we pray all these things in Jesus' name, according to your will and for your glory. And all of God's children, we all say, Amen. Amen. So let's do a little quiz here. How many commandments are there? Ten, right, Pastor? There's ten. Moses came down from Mount Sinai with ten. That's true. But then God came along and said, a new commandment I give to you. Yeah, that's God in human form. We call him Jesus. And so I'm not great with math, but if you've already got ten commandments, and then God comes along and says, now I'm going to give to you a new commandment, ten plus a new one equals eleven. Now, some people will look at that and they'll say, well, no, Jesus said it was a new commandment, but, you know, it wasn't really new. He was just kind of rehashing what had already been taught. He was just kind of repeating, repackaging, repurposing, like you do with those Christmas presents that you don't really like. That's what Jesus, that's what Jesus was doing. No, not really. No, when Jesus says this is a new commandment, Jesus kind of knows what he's talking about, guys. It is a new commandment, and I'm going to give to you two primary reasons why this is, in fact, a new commandment. The first reason I would submit to you that this is a new commandment is that there's a whole new dimension to this commandment. When Moses comes down from Mount Sinai, God has given to him the two tablets of the law. The first tablet deals with man's relationship with God. The second tablet deals with man's relationship with each other. That's commonly how we think of it. But really, we have to remember something. That these two tablets were given to one race of people. These two tablets were given to the Jewish people. They were given to the Jewish people to guide them in how they were to interact with each other. And it's very important to remember that. Because when, when, the, when the Ten Commandments talk about loving your neighbor, not stealing from your neighbor, not killing your neighbor, this was for Jewish people in how they were to interact with fellow Jewish people. And if you doubt what I'm saying, just please think back for just a second. Because when God led the people of Israel into the Promised Land... What was his instructions to the people of Israel regarding the people who were already there? Were they supposed to welcome them in? Were they supposed to intermarry with them? Were they supposed to take on their clothing and their customs? Come on, somebody. Don't, you know the answer to this. Were they supposed to take on their food and their diet? Were they? No, they were not. Why were they not supposed to do that? Because God did not want his chosen people to begin to worship falsely. That's why. And so, for example, Jesus is asked, what is the greatest commandment? As if there's one. Jesus responds, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. On these hang all the law and all the prophets to love your neighbor as yourself, right? Did you catch that? To love your neighbor as who? As yourself. Jesus says, I give to you a, a new commandment, that you love one another, not as you love yourself, are you with me? But as I have loved you. There's a world of difference, a world of difference, if we're just honest about it, between how we love ourselves and how Christ loves us. The thing about it is, is that for the Christian today, our love of others cannot be limited by race. It cannot be. In fact, we're instructed in Scripture that in Christ... There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither freed nor slave. There's neither male nor female. But you are all one in Christ. This is truly a, a new commandment that we have been given. 
It's a new commandment because there's a, a new dimension to it, a new expectation of it. It's also a new commandment because there's a whole new deliverance that Jesus has given to us. The first time the commandments were given, Moses is on Mount Sinai. God has just delivered them from the land of Egypt, across the Reed Sea. They're in the desert. They're going on the way to the promised land, right? Huge deliverance out of bondage, human captivity, huge deliverance. Jesus in John chapter 13 is standing in the upper room of somebody's house. It's Maundy Thursday of Holy Week. And what is Jesus about to deliver us from? He's going to give us deliverance, not just from any human being, not just from any government, but Jesus is going to give us delivery from sin and death and the devil. And while that first deliverance would be commemorated with the Paschal Lamb and the splattering of the blood of the Lamb upon the altar and the Holy of Holies and upon the people, Jesus himself will become the Paschal Lamb. And his blood itself will become our deliverance. Can we give God a praise clap for that this morning? This is the 11th commandment, to love one another as Christ has loved us. And so we would be wise, we would be prudent to reflect for just a minute on what does Christ's love look like? And I worked long and hard, I got my thesaurus out, and I came up with five words. They all start with the letter P. It took a long time to find five words that all start with the letter P. So if you're at home, go, just go ahead and write down the letter P five times. How did Christ love? Because that's what we're called to love others like him. Christ loved, first of all, purely. Pure as the driven snow. See, in God, there is no shadow or turning. God is love, and his love towards us is always pure. And so that's what we are called to be, is like Christ in our love for others. Not to look for something in return. Not, not to have an expectation. Not to do it because we want to get something out of it. But to love as Christ loved, from a, from a pure heart. Secondly, there's a big, big word, pedagogically. I asked my kids after Saturday, last night's service, is it okay to use that word? They said, yeah, Dad, you can use pedagogic. Pedagogically, what does that mean? Pedagogy is the teaching of how to teach, basically, right? And Jesus, in his love for us, listen, stick with me here. Jesus, in his love for us, shows us how to teach others about his love for us and how we receive his love. So, so how do we receive Christ's love? Well, we receive Christ's love by hearing about it in the word of God. We receive Christ's love in the waters of baptism. We're going to receive Christ's love here in just a little bit in the Lord's Supper. And what does Jesus teach us about how to teach others? And it's so important because people are going to ask us, why do you baptize? Why do you take the Lord's Supper? Why does the Bible matter? Is the Bible reliable? Is it trustworthy? And rather than coming up with our own sort of clever answers, why not listen to what Jesus taught and teach like Jesus did? And so Jesus would say things like, for example, regarding Scripture. He would say, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Regarding baptism in John chapter 3, Jesus would say to Nicodemus, one of the great teachers of Israel, man must, you must be born again. And then regarding the Lord's Supper, Jesus teaches us something that I think all too often we forget. And that is what happens itself with the elements. Because when Jesus gives us the Lord's Supper, when he consecrates the elements, when he is done consecrating the elements, Jesus says, looking at that table, looking at the elements on the Passover meal, Jesus says, I will not drink of the cup of the fruit of the vine until I do with you in my Father's kingdom. In other words, in heaven. And what is it that Jesus is teaching us there? That this thing which he has just consecrated still remains truly also wine. And so, yes, we receive his body and his blood for the forgiveness of our sins, but also at the same time, it in its essence has not changed. Right there, Jesus teaches us how we should teach ourselves, how we should teach others about his love for us. Jesus loved purely. He loved pedagogically. 
He loved passionately. We see Jesus expressing his love to his disciples when they're going through times of grief and also when they are joyful. And sometimes we forget about how joyful Jesus was. His entrance into this world was heralded by angels who came with tidings of great joy. In Hebrews chapter 1, we read that Jesus himself was anointed with the anointing of the oil of gladness. And then Jesus would say about himself in John 15, verse 11, These things I have spoken, listen to this now, that my joy, my joy, may be in you, and that your joy may be full. And so I want to encourage you in this coming week, when you hit a dry spot, when you hit a rough spell, when you don't feel so joyful, I want to encourage you to take note. Take note of what it is that's causing you to lack joy in that moment. And then listen to the words of Jesus. Because Jesus said, I have spoken these words that my joy would be in you and that your joy, he wants you to be a joyful person, that your joy would be full. Jesus loved passionately. Jesus loved patiently. There's so many examples of how patient Jesus was in demonstrating his love with his disciples. I just think for one of, of Peter, Satan has come to Jesus and he asked Jesus if he could sift Peter as wheat. Jesus knows Peter's going to deny him. What is Jesus' response? He prays for Peter. And then he goes and he prepares Peter. He tells Peter, Peter, look, I got some news for you. You wouldn't know about this if I hadn't told you, but, but the devil, he wants to sift you as wheat. And, and I hate to be the one to break it to you, Pete, but you're going to deny me three times in the next couple of hours here. Jesus loves Peter so much. He's so patient with him. He knows Peter's going to deny him. He prays for him. He prepares Peter because he knows Peter's going to fail. And then after Jesus has risen from the dead, what does Jesus do but goes and pursues Peter and reinstates Peter into the ministry. Jesus loves you just as patiently as he loved Peter. He can't love you any less. He can't love you any more. So please remember that when you fall short of the glory of God. And finally, I would submit to you that Jesus loved practically. He was very practical in his, in his love of others. That same Peter, he came to Jesus one day and he said, Rabbi, if I forgive my brother Andrew, who's probably you know, standing right there, right? If I forgive my brother seven times, would that be enough? Why does, why does old Pete say to Jesus seven times? The Jewish law only required three times. Peter knew that. So why does he say seven? Well, he knows Jesus has a higher standard. So he probably thinks, well, I'll just double the requirement of law, I'll throw one in for good measure. Seven is the number of completion. He'll be happy with that. What does Jesus say? No, Pete, not seven times, but seven times 70, which is not, Arlene, is not 490 times, literally. So we're not supposed to sit there with a little clicker and, and every time Dick messes up, say, okay, you're getting close. <laughs> right? That, that's not the idea, guys. The idea there is a Jewish way of saying forever, continuously, of the same thing. No matter how many times it irritates you and makes you mad, when he says he's sorry, you say, I forgive you. That's what it is to love as Christ has loved us. It's a very practical love. Jesus is hanging on the cross. He's dying a painful public death. His mother's there at his feet in anguish as any mom would be. Jesus knows he's going to rise from the tomb three days later. He knows he's going to give his mom a big hug. She's going to see her resurrected son. They're going to be happy and joyful. He knows all that's coming, just like he knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the tomb. He, he knows all of that, but just like with Mary and Martha, for his mother also, he enters into that grief and into that sorrow, and, and, and he looks at his beloved disciple, and he says to his beloved disciple John, he says, Behold your mother. 
And to his mother, he says, behold, your son. Because he doesn't want mom to go through these next three days by herself. Jesus is very practical in his love. Before he ascends into heaven, he gives us the Holy Spirit. And one of the primary jobs of the Holy Spirit is to comfort us because we're, we're going to need to be comforted. The 11th commandment, that we would love one another as Jesus has loved us. It's tough. It's hard. It's challenging to do that. It's hard to do that in a marriage. It's hard to do that raising children, dealing with adult parents, fellow church members, neighbors, co-workers. It's very hard to do that. I'm going to close with this illustration. The 1700s, the two best-known preachers, arguably, were George Whitefield and John Wesley. George Whitefield and John Wesley would go on to found what we would call today the Methodist denomination. George Whitefield and John Wesley started out as great friends in the revivals. But gradually over time, they developed a very distinct and sharp disagreement over two doctrines. See, Whitefield believed in double predestination. This, uh, this idea that God actually foreordains people to be damned. We don't, we, don't, we don't believe in that. That was Whitefield's opinion. And Wesley argued vociferously, publicly, vehemently against Whitefield. Wesley, on the other hand, believed in the doctrine of perfection. That you could actually attain perfection through your good works this side of heaven. And we don't agree with that either. And Whitefield did not agree with that, and he publicly, vociferously, vehemently argued against Wesley. And the two became very publicly separate. And he got to the point where one day one of Whitefield's students came to Whitefield and said, do you think we're going to see Wesley in heaven? Whitefield said, no. No, I don't. And Whitefield, when it, it, the student of Whitefield then began to smile, as the story goes. He began to smile. But before Whitefield let his student's smile grow too big, he said, the reason we're not going to see Wesley in heaven is because Wesley has done so many good works that he's going to be seated so close to Christ at the head of the table. We're going to be seated so far back from him, we're not even going to be able to recognize him. That's how great the di distance is going to be between him and us. Whitefield would precede Wesley in death. And one of Whitefield's last requests was that John Wesley would preach his funeral sermon, which John Wesley accepted that assignment. See, brothers and sisters in Christ, one thing we also need to always remember is that doctrine may divide Christian brothers, but the love of Christ always provides the eternal unity. Can we have a good amen in church? Amen. Amen. We've got a great mission statement as a church. We're going to glorify God by spreading the gospel, and we're going to do this by focusing on three things on our preaching on our teaching and on living our daily lives. And if ever there was a verse about how to live your daily life, it would be the 11th commandment. To love one another as Christ has loved us. Jesus stresses this so much that he goes on to say, this will be my last verse, he goes on to say in verse 35 these words, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another as I have loved you. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is serious business. The witness of the church is tied to living in the love of Christ, which means we need to set aside our ideas about what love looks like. And we need to follow the example of our Savior as it is revealed and recorded for us in Scripture. Amen? Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep all of our hearts and all of our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.